from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 123, recorded on December 20th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, the subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today, a wintry day in New York City, are my two fine colleagues, Dixon de Pommier and Daniel Griffin. Hello, Vincent. Hello, Hello. Daniel. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> what would you do if I said Daniel, then Dixon? You would be so mad at me. No, I wouldn't. You'd be burned. No. No, that was actually Daniel on our on our new tech Dixon. on our new textbook. He he goes first because it's alphabetical, apparently. Correct. You know, that's why he's always picked alphabetical. That's not true. I don't pick alphabetical. I mean, that would be <laughs> Alfred last. Ardvark, Ardvark gets picked <laughs> first. <laughs> it's chilly today. It is a little cool out there. But the wind has died down earlier this week. It's and the snow that we had windy. in for yesterday is gone. gone. It's now black ice. <laughs> <clears throat> it's all gone. Yuck. It's the end of uh, the year. This is our last twip for 2016. It's true. Did you want to make any wishes, to Dixon? Yeah, I wish this would continue into 2017. Well, it's not? No, that's a wish. And I think we're, you're going to get your wish. We're going to make this wish come true. And hopefully I, our listeners, right? That's one of their wishes is they hope that we'll continue yeah, to record. And we hope that they continue to listen. We do. I thank all of our listeners for listening and those of them who have supported us, right. we thank you for your support. Yep. All our sponsors for the past year, we thank. If you'd like to help us out, go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have several ways that you can do it. I'll talk about it later. And, you know, if you need some end of year deductions... Yeah, <laughs> the time to donate. Now, exactly that. right. You want to unload some cash? Go for Actually, it. Actually, speaking of the holidays, is now a good time to give Vincent the present that you brought? <laughs> I believe it is, actually. Oh, so please. the two of us have conspired over the last year to produce the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases. And guess what, Vincent? Yeah, no with, along, along with three of our other fine colleagues. No Correct. And we have succeeded. Mm. In fact, we're using the same printer as we used last time, also Sentinel Printing, and they did a fine job. So what printing. we would like to do... Are they in India? Is, no, they're in McLeod, Indiana, uh, Minnesota. Close. <laughs> That's Saint, right. Saint they're God. not in India. This, is, in, this uh, book <laughs> is actually, you know, uh, people bemoan things not made in the U.S. This is it's made, made in, the US. in the U.S. Correct. And it was made affordably. Yes, Amazing. Quite quite remarkable. The the actual cost of printing has gone down over the last ten years. Mm -hmm. Remarkable as it seems. And so it was with great pleasure that Daniel and I offer you a free copy <laughs> of the hard copy of our textbook. Lovely. Thank you very Parasitic much. Parasitic diseases. There's one problem. And what's that? You need to autograph it. Yeah, we'll do that. At, at, you we'll, do it later. Uh, we'll do it later. I want you to both <coughs> write something nice and uh, sign something it. nice. Oh, that's different. As opposed to the usual. <laughs> nastiness oh, sure. <laughs> around the twip table. <laughs> thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, no, you're not Daniel. No, I'm not Daniel. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you, Daniel, very yes. much. It's very heavy. It's it is. It's, it's got nice, twice the nice number poem. of references that we had last time. Very nice. And, and twice the let number me ask of pages, you, please. So this, you can get a free PDF online. You can. You can yes. buy a, a copy of this for $69. That's right? true. Yes. With nine ninety five shipping anywhere, anywhere in, the world. in the world. Anywhere in the world, which is remarkable. And it's going to be updated periodically. It's going to be periodic periodically updated, and there, we're going to put up a Kindle version for sale on That's Amazon right. as well. And we have an iBook version. We'll look at trying yes. to sell as well. But our our main gist is to try to get these distributed for free as much as possible. To um, and we already have sponsors for the Dominican Republic Medical Schools for, for the local Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. That's right. 
and uh, we're working with other medical schools. And the hope is to get these books not only to all the U.S. Uh, medical schools, but as we see with the DR, Haiti, throughout the world. And yeah. are you ready for this? This is good. Lay it on me. The Peace Corps mm. it has already oh, distributed yeah. electronic oh, yeah. versions good. to all of its medical outposts, and we're going to send them hard copies that they're going to distribute as well. Right. Nice. Well, you've got a, I think stuff. you should, don't forget to send one to Donald Trump. <laughs> And Vladimir Putin. We should we should do that. Okay. Actually. Signed. <laughs> Want us to write something nice in those two? <laughs> you know, uh, I wanted to get your opinion on this, both of you gentlemen, you fine gentlemen. Hmm. Now you're you know, kidding. <laughs> well, it's like when they start with like with all due respect you're like yeah, no exactly should i just right. leave now with all, with all due respect that's right, that's right. <laughs> well, as you know several weeks ago donald trump met with technology leaders of he the did. u.s he did. you know this the people from facebook uh, right. google apple uh, Oracle, et cetera, et cetera. And you were Tesla. slighted, you were slighted, right? There was some, no, I'm not you a technology. Didn't get it. <laughs> no, no. But, you know, he said, because you people are brilliant and make great stuff. Yeah. Why doesn't he have yeah. a similar meeting with Big Pharma? Doesn't uh-huh. Big Pharma uh-huh. do even more for our health than technology? It's true. You know, it's a, companies it's a, that make antivirals, point. antibacterials, point. vaccines. Uh, healthcare products of all sorts, yep. Daniel, yeah. not you know just that, drugs. You know, this is interesting because there, there's often a rhetoric, and I, I don't know if you guys remember Al Gore. Um, I do. He invented yeah, well, he the, actually met with Trump. Too. I heard he invented the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but only if you ask Al. I have heard that too. <laughs> now the veracity might be an issue. That's right. <laughs> but um, there was a point when they had, they had looped big pharma in with sort of like the big bad villains that were mm-hmm. apparently destroying the world. And, yeah, and no. I can't say I agree in all honesty. Um, we had dinner last night with Chuck Kinnersh, who's a right. vice president of vaccine development at Pfizer. I think That's it was, right. Right. um, who's actually involved in the whole effort of getting this textbook out yep. there. And one of the co-authors of it with us. Yep. And, um, you know, some of the stories we tell about the distribution of ivermectin, a lot of distribution now of the, the HIV medicines, a lot of, anti-malarial therapeutics um you know it's they are they are primarily profit driven companies but you know when you're choosing how you're going to make your profit i mean there's a lot of there's a really a lot of good genuine hard-working caring people that that work at these industries and um you know and, and they struggle to find that balance but but i think as you're saying um why not talk why not work with these people um, and if it can be done in a way that is profitable, which is reasonable, right? Sure. Um, I, I don't see why that wouldn't be a positive step. You see, Trump knows all about his iPhone, you know, Twitter, Facebook, and he views this as crucial for society. What he doesn't realize <laughs> is that health care, all aspects of health care, is is even more crucial because it keeps people alive. I hope hope he does. I mean, he did mention while he was running that he was an advocate of having some sort of a single payer system, some sort of health care for all. So, you know, I I try to be an optimist. I try to, you know, hope, you know, he's now going to be our president. And so I hope that he is able to do a good job. And I hope that um, he's able to hopefully work with yeah, I um, hope so. All these sectors. he, He should recognize the importance of the industry by meeting with the leaders. Dixon well, des Palmiers. Oh, you're not a head of a company. No, you're right. But he, he does have an economic advisory team, and uh, um, Elon Musk is one of those members. So I, I think that in certain areas, he's very uh, good with that. And in others, for instance, uh, pointing the head of the EPA with somebody who doesn't believe in climate change is not such a good idea. So when you say, and I, that's a very, very understated uh, way of putting that, by the way. When you look at uh, the changes that he's uh, reacted to, uh, from the Democratic Party that would have never done that. Of course, they would have put somebody in there that would support reducing our carbon footprint, et cetera, et cetera. That has economic implications. And, and if it affects business, then I think he's against it. And that's really too bad because a lot of what we need to do is like that. I want to say something else, too, and that is that it's not just big pharma. Look at agrochemical businesses. Uh, if you look at what they produce every year, and it's you know, I'm, I'm not all in favor of everything they do, but if you look at even the most scathing review of the agrochemical business, namely Silent Spring from Rachel Carson back in the 1960s, she didn't say don't use pesticides. She didn't say don't use herbicides. She said use them judiciously. Use them the way they're intended to be used, and I think that's true for drugs as well. 
you know, it's too bad that there are estrogen disruptors. So you're saying do drugs, but in moderation. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> just wanna, do just not do quote drugs you and drive at the same time. That's right. Don't operate heavy machinery after taking this. No, there, there are proper ways of doing this and, and improper ways. And so the one big issue that we have to work out still is how do you prevent unprocessed drug from escaping the human host and entering the environment? How do you mm. interrupt that cycle? Because if we could ever figure out how to do that, then I think the drug industry would be off the hook. All right. Thank you for your views on this matter. And, you know, if we were in a short podcast, we could stop now. We could. Well, I think we, we probably need to start on our clinical case. Yeah, right? it's a good idea, do. Daniel. Good idea. Go for it, big guy. <laughs> okay, big guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is the case from TWIP 122. And um, to remind those who listened last time and then to um, introduce this to those tuning in for the first time. Uh, this is, as I said, first of a series of cases with a particular theme. And as I described, we have a 23-year-old um, female international aid worker um, with a chief complaint of diarrhea. She's of Dutch descent, born in the U.S., but she's been in this rural area of the Western Dominican Republic, close to the Haitian border, for about nine months when this occurs. Um, it has been raining. The houses have tin roofs. Um, some have these flat concrete um, roofs, and then there are these PVC pipes where when it's raining, the water is pouring off through these uh, PVC pipes. She's out in front of the non-government organization, the NGO for which she works. Uh, when along comes a child selling mangoes, she buys one, washes it off with the water coming off of the roof, bites it open, um, and then proceeds to eat the, the mango uh, from there. Uh, that same night, she's not feeling well, a little bit of abdominal discomfort, some loose stools. And the next day, she goes up to the border town of Dahabon, the Haitian border town, and has full-fledged diarrhea. But I think, as we mentioned, there, there's, there's still a little bit of formed feces in there, but it's um, voluminous. Um, she looks in the toilet, and she sees white objects. They're about a centimeter in length. Um, they look something like rice, but they are um, they are moving. Um, as we said, they're uniform width. They are thinner than they are long, but they actually have a width to them. Um, wormy looking. I think that was Vincent put that. In. <laughs> um, now this um, this woman has been participating in other activities in the area. She swims in the local river. She at times walks barefoot. Uh, she eats lots of the local food. Uh, we mentioned lunches are often the rice, the beans, the cooked meat, avocado. Dinner might be um, yucca and fried salami and um, the salted fish they like. Um, healthy before any of this happened. No significant family history. Not on any medicines. Living with one of the local families without any. She has no toxic habits. Lots of dogs, cats, pigs, chickens. And we did bring up, whether it was relevant or not, that one month earlier, the cat in the household... Um, had kittens, and she had lots of contact playing with the kittens. Um, local physician was contacted, and he recommended a certain treatment, and that's that's what we had. All right. Let's see what was guessed by our astute listeners. Indeed. What do you think, Dixon? I think they were very astute. Dixon, take the first one. Please. Sure. Mike writes, Hi, guys. I'm going out. On a very long limb, and guess, this woman has cryptosporidiosis from drinking contaminated water, and then parens he puts cats, question mark, leading to diarrhea, and the worms in her stool are from fruit fly larvae in the mango. Mm. Mike in Oregon. 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 Niraj writes, <clears throat> hello, Twipanorama. <laughs> this is Niraj from murky and rainy South San Francisco, I'm mailing to make a guess for the lady in the case for TWIP-122 based on Dr. Griffin's reported observations. I predict she has a pinworm infection. This can possibly be a result of poor hygiene in her place of residence with the local people. Best way to confirm the infection would be either look for the worms in the perianal region two to three hours after the person is asleep. I can imagine it would be hard to be asleep when some <laughs> ID doc is scratching your posterior outlet. <laughs> A better way to diagnose would be to do the tape test, wherein the perianal skin is touched with a transparent tape to collect 
possible pinworm eggs around the anus. If a person is infected, the eggs on the tape will be visible under the microscope. Once confirmed, the patient can be treated with mebendazole, pyrantel, pamoate, or albendazole. By the way, thanks for reading my mail in relation to the last twip. It was nice to hear your thoughts, especially on the malaria treatment regimen that was presented in the science paper. Dr. R., I just wanted to update you that the study wasn't the work of Sutrovax, the company I work with, so unfortunately I won't be able to tell you the details on any phase one trial that ever gets done, but it is certainly something interesting with respect to how people think about dealing with and controlling the spread of malaria, and especially the lack of good medications, vaccines for prevention compounds the issue even more. Too many young kids in economically weak regions, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, die due to lack of better preventative treatments. Talking about which, what are your thoughts about the initiatives to make transmission-blocking vaccines? I think it could have a huge impact on the overall control of malaria, but then again, I just might be naive in assuming that these things can work as well as they're postulated to be. But all said, it is something I have become increasingly interested in and feel that something significant can be achieved with the present state-of-the-art research. We should do certainly be able to do better than the most recently approved RTSS vaccine for treatment of the same. The efficacy for this approved treatment is far from ideal, and unfortunately, just it's just the best we have at our disposal. Anyhow, enough on malaria, but before I wrap, I would like to respond to Dr. Pommier's query about when was I at the Rockefeller, as I had mentioned in my previous mail. I was there from 2004 to 10, six wonderful years in the most amazing city there is on planet Earth. There you go. I don't think people who haven't lived in Manhattan can ever realize how much stuff happens there <laughs> through every ticking second. Indeed. It's truly a city that never sleeps, and that did help me quite a bit in my graduate life. Late night lab shifts were never a problem, especially with still seeing people around. I believe Rockefeller University has awesome student housing, and it even has a right. bridge which connects the residential building scholars directly to the university. Dr. R., when you when were you staying? Where were you staying when you were a postdoc there? <laughs> I'm assuming the pricing was a lot more subsidized back then. Wasn't a postdoc there. I was at MIT. Right. You know, you may be thinking, David Baltimore, he was president of Rock, That's but right. I was with him before. He, he went also to went to Rock. school there, by the way. He did. Finally, now you're going to confuse him. David Baltimore <laughs> went to school there, not Rackney Elioli. Right, no, 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 I meant right? David. Okay. Finally, it's great to gain more knowledge through the Twix series of podcasts. I can't imagine a better use of my time than listening to one of those, especially on the painfully slow commute to my home, where in a 10 mile mm. drive takes an average of 45 to 60 minutes. Oh, dear. I hope there will be a few more episodes before Christmas. P.S. Driving to work, I saw the symbol for the gas station Valero, and the nerd in me reacted by <laughs> thinking that the swiggly creature wrapped around the V looks like Ascaris. <laughs> That's how badly vested I am with parasitology now. Excellent. You're hooked. <laughs> Nixon, do you have any opinions on transmission-blocking malaria vaccines? I do, I do, I do. Actually, uh, Dr. Robert Guads and other colleagues at the NIH uh, had collaborated to make a... Uh, an antibody preparation against the uh, gametocytes mm -hmm. of, of plasmodia. And uh, it actually worked beautifully. It, it actually prevented that uh, from transmitting. So um, it's got a lot of potential, but remember, it's an altruistic vaccine. It's not going to prevent malaria in the patient. It will prevent the patient from spreading the malaria to somebody else, to the mosquito. So that's the reason why it's pretty low on everybody's um, list of things to do. But still, it, it works very well. All right. Daniel. Daniel. So is that an Ascaris? <laughs> just looking at it. It certainly I don't think looks. Uh, intended it to be an Ascaris. It looks wormy, doesn't it? It does. An Ascaris is more. Um, no, it's it's pretty good Ascaris. I wonder Ascaris. what the significance of that is on the Valero. So while I read, do you want to look that up for, for me? Okay, <laughs> Shelby writes Hello, Twipsters. Greetings from Nashville, where it's a rainy 12 degrees C. Yeah. It sounds like the young American mango eater of Dutch descent as hookworms, possibly Nicator americanus. The papain or lupiole, papain, 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 papain yeah. or lupiole, am I getting that one? In the mango could have acted as a stressor to the helminths, causing them to abandon ship <laughs> via diarrhea. Treatment, a course of ivermectin and some comfortable shoes to hopefully reduce the risk of reinfection from can fecal contaminated soil mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Shelby. P.S. Dr. Griffin, could you explain <laughs> your pronunciation of santimeter? After Googling sonometer, I found <laughs> that it was a preferred pronunciation of sonometer amongst some healthcare professionals. But aside from that, couldn't find a more detailed answer. Um, well, I will, I will give my personal history of the pronunciation. And uh, when I went to medical school at NYU School of Medicine here on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, Indeed. there um, were some outstanding um, anatomy professors. Right. Um, but short-lived, which is actually kind of a shocking thing, there was a high mortality among the, uh, among the professors in that department. Actually, two, two of the three died during my time there. My goodness. And um, one, of the, one of them um, had this pronunciation of centimeter yes. and uh, it actually became almost like a sort of a, a hallmark a trademark and a, an affectation of people that had gone to nyu and you would sort of recognize centimeter. In centimeter. centimeter and then i think as you know as his disciples spread um is actually he was one of the gentlemen that died um during my time there um this continued so I, I sort of stick with it as sort of an entertaining I throwback see. to, you know, this professor who I, I, I respected greatly. But I, I know, um, I've but, heard other people pronouncing well, it. Well, there, 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 th there are some theories about this. So it originally comes from the Latin, right, for 100. Yeah. And you may have heard people say, like, you know, I, I had to walk, you know, 10 kilometers, <laughs> you know, the kilo and the... And now the French introduced this, and I think we're about 1800 or so, when they have this, the metric system, Maybe people have heard of that in America. And so, and the, and the French, you know, is a son, and then you could sort of continue on from there. Some people claim they're pronouncing it because of the, the connection to the French. I, I mean, I don't know. Hmm. What I say is it's a living language, and I'm, I'm you know, participant in killing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it continues to get resurrected. <laughs> but no, it, it has actually interesting. A lot of people in healthcare have, uh, you, you do notice that. Centimeter. They'll say centimeter. centimeter. Um, but both, both are considered correct. Yeah. Um, as long as you spell it right. Yeah, my wife's mother was a nurse. She said sonometers. Did she? Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder where that. I mean, because you know, the person I picked this up from may have had someone else. And interesting enough, Bellevue was the first place they trained nurses. They came up with this crazy idea that one, you should take vitals, and two, that nurses should actually get an education. Right. And uh, so I don't know if somehow you know, sort of the birthplace, because that's where I trained, was over at Bellevue. Whether or not this sort of spread from some. So there's a wonderful Cole Porter song. I believe it's by Cole Porter, or that can be checked easily. So you say potato and I say potato. You're probably wrong. And <laughs> when it was first, no, it was Ira Gershwin. It was the Gershwin boys, I believe. And one of them wrote the words, one of them wrote the melody, and then they got together and, and they had a skit on Saturday Night Live of them getting together for the first time for the song. And the guy at the piano s starts to play, and the, and the guy singing the song says, you say potato and I say potato and you say <laughs> tomato and i say tomato wait a minute what is this song all about <laughs> george and ira gershwin george and ira gershwin right, right it had to be brothers because that's that was what was going on so i'll read the next one how's that well you already read one i did well i can get to read two and maybe no we have to go in order i, I, I thought think, we were going in order. yeah you yes. went you me and daniel oh yeah you're it right for you. once look at that for, that's so generous of you, Vincent. Thank add, that you so much. add that to the show notes. This is the time. Go ahead. Go ahead yeah, right. Okay. Here we go. David writes, dear Twip doctors, I believe that this aid worker has contracted dipolidium caninum from the kittens, or rather the fleas on those kittens. She played with a month earlier. According to the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases, Within 25 days of ingestion of an infected flea, <clears throat> the worm begins to release gravid perglottids into the lumen of the intestine where they can e exit the body along with the feces. This fits the time frame between when she potentially contracted the worm and when she finally begins to shed the perglottids in her stool. How does that fit the time frame of one day? <clears throat> 25 days. It's, it's about a month. It's the right about a month. Time, it is the right time. I thought she she ate the mango and then that evening. No, no, he's oh, not no. relating this to he's the mango. Relating he's relating the, it to the kittens. The kittens beam. Uh, which were born 25 days earlier. Got it. At any rate, that's that's okay. Um, let's see now. I don't know why was I, I before I was so Mango really with kittens. <laughs> <Dixon>. <laughs> right. Um, right. This worm is 
most prevalent in children younger than eight. However, given that she was playing with kittens in an environment that favors growth and development of pathogens, the chances for infection are much more likely. The rainwater-washed mango may have been a red herring for these worms. However, it is possible another pathogen helped to exacerbate the woman's diarrheal symptoms, allowing her to more clearly see the worms. At first, I thought these could be pinworms or another worm contracted from the mango, but shedding worm slash proglottids within a day of infection did not make any sense. It is possible she might be harboring another pathogen, a uh, toxic E. coli, perhaps. I found an interesting article on traveler's diarrhea spread through mangoes <laughs> entitled When the Mango Bites Back. <laughs> As always, thank you for your informative and entertaining podcasts. I will give the podcast and its hosts, no pun intended, a shout out during my next Journal Club presentation. Gee, that's nice. Sincerely, David. Tony writes, Dear Parasitophorus Doctors, I'm a long-time fa fan of Twim, Twiv, and of course Twip. First of all, sorry for my English. I am a Spanish clinical microbiologist, and English is not my first language. In relation to Twip 122, there are several options. One, because usually helminths have a first period within the human host where they are not readily detected, known as pre-patent period. I think the recent history facts have nothing to do with the moving parasite encountered in the feces. I mean, the acquisition of the parasite must have occurred sometime before, probably weeks, months, or even years, and has nothing to do with the mango consumption of the rainy weather. Two, a moving worm-like parasite, one centimeter in length, strongly suggests the Taenia species, as Taenia solium sheds not moving proglottids, and Taenia saginata does moving ones, I would think, of the later latter species. T. saginata need to shed modal proglottids since its intermediate host cows are not coprophagous animals, so the proglottids need to somehow look for the next host. On the other hand, pigs are feces lovers, so T. solium doesn't need to shed modal proglottids since the intermediate host, that is pigs, will go feces hunting. That said, the clinical picture doesn't fit very well with T. species, Tinea species infection, where diarrhea is not a usual presentation. It usually causes very few symptoms, if any, and it usually is detected when modal proglottids are expelled within the feces. The proglottids are quite square, whitish, and around one centimeter wide and long. They are not worm-shaped. So I, I noticed that Dixon was squirming a little during that. Did you want to— A little to, bit. Uh, I think that both proglottid species, that is to say both Tinea species, produce modal uh, proglottids, and so I don't know where the information comes from that suggests that one has and one doesn't have— but I believe I've seen both of them in the laboratory as a technician, so I can attest to the fact that they are both uh, quite modal. All right. Yeah, Tony, if I was under the same impression too. So, Tony, if you've got um, more information, that would be, you know, it may be slightly different um, as a general rule. So, it'd be interesting to hear if he's got some right. source on this. Right. Three, a modal one centimeter long worm like parasite also reminds me of Enterobius vermicularis. Adult females usually deposit eggs around the anus at nighttime or during the siesta or nap, but again, the clinical picture doesn't fit exactly with the usual one. Mm. As eggs are usually not detected in the feces, we need to perform a specific test, the gram test. First time, from time to time, you can even catch the adult female as she is in her perianal trip. Trap? What is the trip? All right. I think it's probably the trip, like she's heading on her -R -R way out. Yes. And I even once was lucky enough to see an adult female stuck to the scotch tape. But again, diarrhea is not a frequent symptom, but right. doesn't rule out. Right. For lastly, the worms encountered in the feces could be of non-human origin. It's not unusual for laboratory workers to receive specimens of such type. There are worms everywhere, or really everywhere. <laughs> it is not unusual to earthworms to be found around or even inside feces when these are deposited outdoors. But this is not to say that the worms are human origin. When a patient comes to my laboratory bringing a worm, the first question I always ask is, have you really witnessed the parasite going out with the feces? Mm -hmm. If it was the case in our study, other more frequent causes could be assigned as a cause of diarrhea, mm -hmm. virus, bacteria, or even protozoal parasites. P.S. I really enjoyed the Dr. De Pommier book, People, Parasites, and Plowshares. And as suggested in this book, the other equally fantastic book from Robert Desowitz, New Guinea Tapeworms and Jewish Grandmothers. Finally, can I do a suggestion for future episodes? I suggest you could treat the very interesting theme of hygiene hypothesis, the relationship mm -hmm. between parasites and autoimmune disorders and the medical uses of parasites for autoimmune and other 
inflammatory diseases. Nice, nice. Congratulations for your excellent program and keep on doing it. All right. Bjorn writes, hi, I'll venture a diagnosis to the 23-year-old female aid worker in the DR. The relevant facts of this case seem to be she's got diarrhea, she's eaten a mango washed in water of dubious provenance, she's eaten many kinds of food, been in contact with many species of animals, including cats, dogs, and chickens. She's not taken many precautions against possible infections. She's observed some larvae-like motile things in her diarrhea. The toilet she observes this in is not one she's using every day since she's out traveling to a border town. So from this, it's actually very difficult to come up with a certain diagnosis, but here's a list of plausible explanations that all end up explaining the observable signs. The larvae-like things in her stool should, of course, be examined, but my guess is that they are insect larvae of some kind that originated in the toilet, not her intestines and only got mixed with her stool when she defecated. Also, nothing she ate the day before would have had time to develop this far in just a day or so. From the story, as I was told, I would be suspicious of the water used to wash the mango. That water could have been contaminated with bird poop, rat poop, mouse poop, <laughs> bat poop, cat poop, dog poop, human poop, and lots of other things that could make you sick. Nothing definitive here, however. The diarrhea could be caused by a really long list of agents, but bacterial or viral gastroenteritis would both be high on my list of differentials. Norovirus, rotavirus, salmonella would be three, but I'm sure there are plenty more. If the water used to wash the mango was the source of the infection, then some bacterial viral infections could have had time to develop into disease, even if it's only a few hours since exposure. Her contact with chicken would also represent a risk for salmonella, so that is a possibility. Malaria can cause diarrhea, and there's a certain malaria in DR. She doesn't report chills or fever, but that doesn't mean she doesn't have it. Does she take malaria medication? Cats and dogs could equal hookworm. However, since this is TWIP, we also have to include at least Giardia, Cryptosporidium, and Entamoeba histolytica in our list of differentials. Again, ample possible sources uh, of possible infection in her lifestyle. She doesn't report foul smell from her stool, so Giardia therefore isn't high on the list. Crypto certainly is possible. Entamoeba histolytica tend to produce bloody stool, dysentery, but perhaps only diarrhea the first day before it's at high time to fully develop, and so on. There are just too many candidates to list here, and none seem to be much more obvious than any others. We've got a little smiley face there. Um, tests, temperature, fever, CRP, antibody tests, etc., to confirm, rule out viral bacterial gastroenteritis, perhaps PCR of stool. PCR microscopy of stool to look for Giardia, crypto, helmets, entamoeba, histolytica. Malaria antibody test, blood smear. Microscopy, magnifying glass, tweezers, scalpel, and a good text on entomology to identify or not the larvae-like entities. However, she recovered in one way or another, in addition to got some good instructions on how to perhaps have somewhat lower risk of profile for infections and perhaps even some deworming medication just in case. My guess on the theme Dr. Griffin was alluding to, perhaps this is really hard because we don't know enough and that what we know is confusing. I, was get, I would guess that is a rather common situation in the field. I love your podcast. I'm a telecom computer engineer that has been listening to Twix since I took Vincent's virology course on Coursera in 2013, which I did for no other reason than Vincent being very enthusiastic in his lectures. You guys are an inspiration. Best wishes, Bjorn. Nice. Lovely. I thought we had some well, good, I think some good emails this time. Of good emails. differentials, yep. right? <laughs> and I like that. I liked, um, you know, the, the differentials. And I even liked um, where people like Bjorn does here going into how are, you know, what would be the next step if we had, you know, resources, diagnostic resources. No. Right. We only have a, a description from the patient. And um, that can be somewhat confusing because she's not a trained parasitologist. So. How would she know how to describe the entities that she uh, saw in the in the stool? And you're in shock too because you're seeing something there that shouldn't be there, 
So you're surprised, shocked, and confused all at the same time. And um, it, it's not easy to go from here to the correct answer, but that is exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> Speaking of shock, I remember a story. A physician, she went to the bathroom and was shocked to see blood in the toilet and was said, oh, crap, I have colon cancer and forgot she had just eaten beets not right. too long before. Oh, Can wow. you imagine a physician would forget? Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> I, could, I, could see, I could see that. Impossible. <laughs> there's, there's something about when it's you, you know, when it becomes yeah, personally, course. a lot Good of question. people no go into a panic. Question. No. So, Daniel, last time you had mentioned at the end that she went to a local physician who treated her. Well, I, I think what I mentioned, pretty sure I mentioned this. So she contacted him by telephone. Telephone. Described this yes. and said, <laughs> what should I do? And, and he so he, he, made a, he made a certain suggestion of what she should do. And, um, and, and that was how initially I was, I was told of the case. And then, right. then I started to think about it. And I thought, you know, this is interesting. There's, there's a lot here, as I think... Um, some of our people emailed brought up. So one was the mango, right? It's a mango. And I was like, oh, that's right. great. It's mango. <laughs> and I think, Vincent, you sort of immediately clued on this. What is interesting about the skin of a mango? And one of our email people brought this up as well. And it has a couple substances that are just impossible to pronounce for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, papain is a meat tenderizing uh, enzyme, which is uh, found in papaya as well. So if you want to eat a lot of steak... Have a have a uh, a salad made with pap papaya, and you would get enough pap pain to digest a, a half of a steer if you wanted it, which is kind of crazy, but that's the way it is. I don't know. I'm not familiar with the other substance. That Vincent, was mentioned. did you uh, were you were you thinking of something specific when I when I brought up the the mango and the mango skin? You know, I didn't. But now um, thinking about it, let me ask you one question. Has she eaten mangoes before? Uh, um, she uh, yeah, she has. Response. She has. And actually, um, you know, uh, there were those substances that were brought up that I can't pronounce. But there's another <laughs> substance that's in the mango skin um, called, and again, I, I'll, why don't I spell this yeah, to Dixon and it. he can say it for <laughs> Well, I'll give it my best so, shot. So, U-R-U-S-H-I-O-L. Urushyl? Urushyl? It's basically the same substance that's in poison ivy. Oh and God. it is in the skin of mangoes. So people who have a, a, a particular like poison ivy hypersensitivity, oh my God. touching the skin of a mango wow. um, can actually create a poison ivy mm -hmm. type contact dermatitis on your hands, on your lips, on your mouth, actually even in your GI tract. Wow. So it's usually not a great idea to bite off um, right. the, the mango skin. Right. And so, you know, when I first got that, that was one thing I thought about. This is interesting. Yeah. I mean, her diarrhea could be caused by the fact that here's a woman who, like many individuals, is very sensitive to this. Um, and it's um, it's actually sort of a, you know, in the poison ivy in particular, it's part of an oily compound. So it can be really hard to get this stuff off. And um, I don't think the water coming off the roof with, you know, whatever content level of the poop as we learn um, is going to necessarily wash that off so putting that in your mouth and biting into the mango is right. usually not a great right. idea hmm. right. um, so so papain is a protease the other is lupiol which is in mango mm -hmm. it is a triterpenoid with several activities it's also in other plants as well it is an anti-inflammatory it inhibits IL-4 production by TH2 cells. Look at that. <laughs> this is all this science. <laughs> but it's in mangoes, and it has other activities as in well. In the skin? Yeah. Well, actually, in the pulp. In it the says pulp. it's in the pulp. Right. You know, mango. Um, and the papain must papain be. Papain and, and, uh, and, and this are in the pulp, yeah. Also, yeah. Well, which, I mean, she's going after the pulp. Yeah, eating, but the ural shile is, is, in the, is in, just in the skin. So someone prepares this for you. Um, you know, you're you're good to go. Also, if someone prepares for you, you get to really see the mango and make sure you're not eating something that maybe you don't want to eat. But you know, there. this is this is twip. I can't imagine that we would not have a parasite here. There, there's going to be. There's going to be. <laughs> there's going to be something. Right. So that was one of the first things. Now, the doctor in the Dominican Republic brought up um, his concern. He said, "You know, I worry whether or not this is hookworm." Mm -hmm. And so, so Dixon, what do you what do you think? You know, and so that's us to up oh, this woman. She was overconfident. She ate a mango and got some hookworm, and 
Does that make any sense? What What are we? Not to me, it doesn't. Okay, and, what, and besides, these are white worms. So hookworms, adults at least, are not white at all. In fact, they're filled with blood. Their gut tract is filled with blood. So if you look at them, they've got a reddish tint to them. Okay, and they're they're tissue eaters. They're actually blood sucking and tissue eaters at the same time. They feed on the villus tissue and they suck blood for reasons which up until very recently were not even speculated on but but it's now con- considered to be a micro aerophilic organism and maybe the oxygen that supplies this worm with its uh, needs comes from our blood supply that it sucks right through its gut tract because it doesn't get digested it comes right out the mm-hmm. back of the worm almost the same as it went in uh, and that's quite an interesting feature of this parasite but to wash out Hookworms with a with a fruit just doesn't happen. That's just not going to happen. Uh, and so these things really bite onto the villus, and they don't let go. So the, the being hookworms, I think, is out of the question. Yeah, the, the hook. It might be the right size. Yeah, the the hookworm. I think there's a there's several issues. So you know, we, we I think we said last time we're going to start talking about the life cycle, sort of helping people with that. So yeah. so if you think about the life cycle of the hookworms, as our email people brought up. Is it's you don't get it by eating the hookworm mm, eggs, or you uh, would say, of course not. This is you know you get, parasite, you get it by the parasite eating you. <laughs> yeah, the parasite actually um, it yeah. it enters through the skin. They actually like to come down the the hair shafts and then enter through through the base of a hair shaft. So right. so you're walking around barefoot, and um, you know maybe she going to does, which she yeah. you know so she's at risk for a hookworm. She's walking around barefoot. And then the the hookworm are then going to often they'll be in the grass or there, mm-hmm. and they're going to penetrate the skin, and then they're going to go through a period of time. They will. Um, there's this pre patent period, right? They're going to enter the bloodstream. They're going to go around. They're going to go through the heart. I mean, they they've got a whole big long. She's been in the Dominican um, Republic for some time though. There's so really a so it is so blood. it is long enough um, that she could have gotten them at some That's other right. time, some right. other. So she she could very well have hookworm, right? right. And even, you know, let's say you went ahead and did a over parasite and you saw the hookworm. And you say, oh, she's got hookworm. But, right. you know, yes, yes, and, and unrelated. And the, and the unrelated is, is I think, twofold. One is, as we pointed out, she describes as they looked like rice. So yeah. whitish. And, and, you know, one is pretty hard to get the hookworm to wash out. I mean, because they, I they have this, they, I mean, out. they have this adherent, I mean, they are, they are holding on. That's true. Um, you know, otherwise it'd be a problem because people in these areas, they have diarrhea all the time. So if the organism right. didn't evolve this cytoadherent structure um, where it really can bite and hold on, um, they're going to get washed right out. It's just not going to be a successful organism. Right. So you're not going to really see them. And the other is that they're, they're more thread-like. They're long, they're mm-hmm. skinny, they're pinkish. They don't look like rice. They don't look like sort of short, stubby. Um, you know, they sort of have little pointed ends, I guess I would say. But but uh, you may have mentioned this, but you wouldn't find worms in the stool. You'd find eggs, right? True, true, because they're cytoadherent. So they are staying. Yeah. The eggs yeah. are the only thing that's really that's coming right. out. That's right. That's right. You know, could, let's say, oh, but she had this sort of reaction to the urochial, right? And and it caused like an inflammation, a contact dermatitis in the gut and then they came out yeah you have to start getting pretty creative um (laughs) but not true yeah so i don't think so so what what else leaves us with very little options (laughs) well someone someone uh someone mentioned ascaris right yeah well that's and that's not right big worm ascaris is going to be big long but also you'd see you'd see eggs in the stool not worms right well she wouldn't see them (laughs) You know, occasionally, them, occasionally yeah. you will. Occasionally, you'll actually see a worm comes out. I mean, the they're kid big. gets sick, and but they they look like earthworms. You it's know, to the your pencil. Come yeah, on. they're big. They're big. They're not. They don't look like grains that's, of rice. That's right. Well, what yeah. does look like grains? How about of a whipworm? Whipworms are too big. Too big. Too big. And I, and I tried to make that. And the point. wrong size. The wrong shapes. Yeah, long. It's called a whip. Yeah, for yeah good these reason. are these are short worms. Right? Short, stubby. Modal. Maybe white they're not lunches. worms. Maybe they were actually larvae. Maybe they're something. So, so else. what I what I did, right? I mean, you know, and this this is tough, right? We're going to sort of, you know, I, I'm, we're going to give our impression of what we think it is because I I really like to come up with this is what I think it is, right? And then I really want, you know, the confirmatory, you know, we took those and then we brought them to a lab <laughs> right. and, and someone, you know, <laughs> who is a trained. Uh, one other thing to mention here, of course, is this yep. is a one-time only incident. She never had this happen to her again. Then, yeah, then she's all bad. So the, it's it's one dose. It's out. She looks. She's a little bit upset by what she sees. 
of course, the next time he defecates. Where's defecate? the iPhone taking a good picture? <laughs> High resolution exactly. for me. Which, well, the next time she defecates, I'm sure she looked again and she didn't see anything. <laughs> just feces. So and the what, next time she looked, she didn't see anything. Just feces. So, so I so I had ideas on what I thought it was. So I did the approach, the usual suspect approach, and right, mm-hmm. sure. and I had her had her look at two different photos. Excellent. And she said, "Oh, those are them." There you go. And then the other one is, "Oh, and what are those?" <laughs> and so um, I'm going to show. I show the two pictures I showed. Um, this that this young woman looked at. Here we go. And. Uh, these okay. were these were the two choices. I got to put them out so everyone everyone who's listening can see these. <laughs> oh my! Okay, and what do you want to describe? What we're looking at, Vincent or Dix? Who wants to describe? I can describe it okay. pretty well, unless Vincent wants to have a go at it. Also, so on the on my left is it looks like an endoscope picture, but it might not be an endoscope picture. But it it probably but is. actually is. You're you're inside of the intestines. You're inside there. the intestines, and you're I don't know whether you're low down or not, but what you what I see here are whitish objects, uh, and they are blunted at one end, and they're of two different sizes. And in fact, one looks like it's attached to the other one, and in fact, it is attached to the other one. What you're looking at here are hookworm adults. Uh, there's a hookworm male, yeah. which is smaller than the female. He's attached to the female by his bursa, and they're both feeding. And you can see a little... Um, You'd call them petechiae, probably. Yeah, you would call them petechiae. Uh, around the mouth portion of each of these adult worms. And what you're really looking at here in the small intestine is a patent hookworm infection. That's exactly what this is. Okay. The second picture is taken au naturel, so to speak, in nature, outside of any human host. It is a picture of maggots. And these maggots have a very interesting shape. One end is a blunt uh, shape. They're all white, by the way, they're, and they're, you can't see inside the uh, the maggot. And at the other end, there's this little black dot. Okay, and the, and that end is much more tapered than the, uh, the, the first end that I described. So one end is blunt, the other end is pointed, and, and the giveaway, the real giveaway, is that it's segmented. Now, nematodes are not segmented, and arthropods, many of them, are segmented. And in this case, what you're looking at are fly larvae of some sort, right? That's what I'm looking at. Yeah. And, that's- and so what I showed when, mm-hmm. when she looked at these two pictures, um, the, uh, <laughs> she the ladder, the, the ladder, she, the first uh, <laughs> she said, those are them, those, those, right. white, those white guys on the pieces uh, that of That was mango. a clever yeah. lineup that you supplied for her to look at well I, you know because the, the doctor good. down there was concerned about hookworm so i wanted to say it's what hookworm looks yeah, like exactly. this is what um fruit fly larva look right, like right um what it what you know what was the one i, I should have thrown like a few others right i just thrown a big asterisk in there that was Perhaps. the picture of the one with the nose that you've got i think yeah. uh, <laughs> or or maybe even an adult pinworm. So, so it is interesting i mean i i think that i i felt reasonably convinced that what she was seeing were actually fruit fly um larva from or some other is, dipterin uh, which feeds on mangoes. mangoes. Yeah. So Mike, yeah. Mike in Oregon was right. Mike in Oregon was correct. Yeah. So I mean, I don't, I don't know for certain, right? Because I didn't get to see these myself. I didn't get, you know, a, a Bob That's Quads right. to look at them for me to to well, tell me that you didn't you know, have them. So how could you? Yeah. Do that? So so this was sort of what I felt was the best approach to to basically take the patient and educate her to the point where she could say, mm-hmm. "Oh, I now recognize that what I'm seeing." That's right. Um, it right, is so, similar to what so that had nothing to do with her diarrhea then. Well, so that's that's an interesting but issue. Mike was only half right, by the way, Vincent, because he actually guessed that she had also had yeah, no, dysbiosis. He was but, the only one that guessed fruit fly larvae that, from the mango, that right. so he was right on that, that count. Right. So, so what part, do you think? What do you think about that? Do you think it's possible, um, Dixon, that she these were in the mango and she un you know accidentally. Um, not paying attention, ingested either eggs or later Watched. larvae stage, and yeah. then they passed. Would actually, they that's, pass? that's interesting because the timing issue, I, I buy that actually. It's, the gut transit um, time is about right. Yeah. These did not induce a, an immediate reaction. It took overnight for these to pass down the length of the intestinal tract. Remarkably, they remained alive. Mm, I'm surprised they're intact. 
Um, well, yeah. they, so actually, there exactly. there is a. I'll give this over. Did you want to look at those? No, but what's um, the, what's the exterior of these segments? Cuticle. It's cuticle. It's cuticle. So it's, it's it is cuticle. Huh? Yeah, it is cuticle. Resistant and this- to most of our enzymes because mm. we don't have a chitinase, and the chitin is a, a, a an integral part of that uh, structure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So actually, this this is a described entity. Yep. You know, and the timing so this is and everything myiasis. else. myiasis. We would call this one intestinal myiasis. Oh my Just, gosh, that's what I have on my next sheet in my notes. <laughs> intestinal myiasis. For the term, <laughs> you know, we uh, come when you, we co-wrote this book together. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so this is a this is a not a disease state because they didn't cause any illness. They passed on through basically, but there are states of illness which are caused by uh, other. Um, Dipterin larvae, which can invade, let's say, a wound. And if they lay their eggs on the uh, open wound, uh, the maggots that hatch out of the eggs can ingest not just the dying tissue, but also can ingest the living tissue as well. Uh, There are special flies which only eat dead tissue, and they have been used in the past and in the present also, I believe, to debride uh, large gaping wounds which have uh, necrotic edges to them. It's also used to debride. Mm-hmm. Um, um, well, I, we have a picture in our book, which I'm sure some of our listeners will find truly um, uh, revolting and and, just, and hard to take. But a, a homeless person was brought into the emergency room, which had uh, he, his entire nasal passage was filled with fly larvae. They were invading a tumor which had been growing in his nasal passage, and they were eating that tissue. Uh, It was very, very difficult to, uh, I think, to convince a resident to sit there patiently and pick them out. (laughs) You know, if you trade in New York, you see see a bit of this. You do see uh, it. You do see it. there, There was an idea, which we realize now is not completely true, that they would only eat dead tissue. So the idea was these things are great. Uh, yeah. They're going to eat all the dead tissue. They're going to give you a nice margin, and then you know you, you leave them on until they've done their job. But now we realize that they, they won't just stop when they get to living tissue. They're actually going to go ahead and um, – and it is interesting. You brought up, Vincent, you know, the, oh, my gosh, they, they somehow made it through the mm-hmm. whole track. Yeah. And so intestinal myiasis, as we're seeing in this case, um, there's only a few agents that actually have a cuticle um, mm-hmm. that will allow them to make it all the way through without being um, – dissolved i guess or degraded or destroyed and so like the lesser house fly can actually do this Mm -hmm. um there's the black soldier fly (laughs) Uh, there's a short list there's the coffin fly (laughs) the australian cheap blow fly the stable fly um so there's there's a number number of these flies and there you know these are actually i bet some of our listeners know something about these because i now understand in some of these tv shows ones which i've actually not seen but Apparently, I must. Um, they use these in forensics, oh, right? And right. some in some of the TV sure. shoes, they've sort of brought this to you know. There's one the show that's really popular now. It's a public television show called. Uh, <laughs> block, block, block! I just saw it. Uh, Tales of the Dead, or something like. It's it's not Stories of the Dead. It's. Um, I'll think of it. I'll, yeah, I'll, but I'll the, the Mucina stabulans is actually this one where you stage the development and you can say, oh, this yeah. body's been here for this well, they te- they period take of pigs. time. What they do is they take pigs. They slaughter some pigs and they leave them in the woods. And then they come back and visit those pigs every day for like, say, a month. And uh, they get the story of succession of arthropods that take advantage of the dead carcass. And, and they're different at various times. And so that's how you can actually get some yeah. estimate as to how old the, the carcass is. Yeah. So Dixon, do you know one of the myiases is bot fly? Yeah, we talked about that. Yep. We did take it's a that. fly. That's right. That's right. Laying a, an egg and then it hatches later, right? Deposited on the skin actually, by a your this was the, the, the Belize, Bowl. the Belize bot butt bot fly, right? That's right. That's right. right. <laughs> it came out on Super Bowl Sunday. Yes, it came out on Super Bowl Sunday because I think, uh, what, his team was losing, and it's just like, I'm not hanging out with this guy anymore. I'm finding a host who knows which team to root for. So that's it. That and, would have and made it is, her And it is sick. interesting. It would the have given her diarrhea. Well, the intestinal myosis itself can give you abdominal pain, yeah. even vomiting, and diarrhea. So so maybe, again, we're not sure. You know, it could have been something else. could have been a reaction to the mango. She could have gotten something else at the same time. I mean... Um, so my you know. my question would be: Could she have eaten enough um, 
uh, larvae without noticing it. So she could have. She could have. And even this they thing could have, been, have to be full of them. They right? even could be eggs. So what the fruit fly does, the fruit fly has the ability to penetrate the skin of the mango and then deposit the eggs right under, under the, the surface skin. there. So if you're not really looking, you know, because it's sort of a fleshy, um, hmm. you know, thing. And, and, you know, she bites it off and then she kind That's of right. messily eats it. That's right. Um, you, you could accidentally ingest either eggs that are just about to hatch or early stage larvae that have a cuticle that allow it to survive and pass through. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I wanted to point out, like I, I referred to this woman <laughs> as attractive, right? Last time. And, and I tried to sort of set this tone for, for these aid workers um, because what I don't want people to have the perception is that she was like this ugly American who went there and, you know, the, the kid gave her like this mango, you know, because they didn't, you know, and she's a woman who actually, when she showed up there, she didn't speak any Spanish. And in the nine months, she's gotten to know the people. She's translating for other aid workers. So she's someone that they like. She's, she's we'll say, an attractive person. She's liked by the locals. This was an accident, I think, on all quarters. Oh, sure. She didn't mean to do it. Oh, absolutely. They didn't mean to uh, to right. give her a bad mango. It's just stuff happens. Stuff happens. <laughs> didn't mean to give her a bat. <laughs> That's right. That's nice. So your point is, they all liked her very much, and they wouldn't do anything to harm her. Right. Well, I, 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 just, I just want to suggest that yeah. I don't think that this was intentional. Yeah, yeah. I think that this was, you know, this was someone they liked, someone who was there making a difference, and um, it was an accident. So this, Dixon, is this a parasite? No. Why not? <laughs> Why not? It's not a parasite. Why? Well, because it, it went through the host didn't ingest any of the host itself mm. and came out the other side unaltered. Basically, it was just passing through, so to speak. Didn't take anything from the didn't host. Didn't take anything from the host. Didn't, didn't know how to do so What would you call it? A myositis. What is it again? Oh, Intestinal myiasis. My, my Accidental myiasis. passenger. Doctor, yep. there's a myiasis. That's right. <laughs> In my soup. <laughs> yeah, but it's really, it's really true. Like when we talk about like how do we define the parasite is that now, if it had in actually invaded and spent some time and, and somehow taken advantage of her. Uh, um, so this is sort of interesting. You know, it, it isn't even quite an ectoparasite. You know? Yeah, and yes. Right. You know, in fact, you know, when we, we talked about pinworm, not hookworm, but pinworm, mm. pinworm does not derive anything from the host that the host doesn't want to part with. The pinworm adults feed on feces. <laughs> so you can't honestly say that it's depriving us of a meal since we've already had our go at it. So we got to take that chapter out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what happens is, of course, that little kids start to itch and scratch themselves because the pinworms, when they die and release their eggs, the um, fluids in the cavity of the, in of the pinworm itself elicits an allergic response. And so there is some later on pathology associated with a chronic pinworm infection in kids. So what about the psychological impact on this poor woman? Well, the, that's, <laughs> see, that's, you know, that's like. hard to evaluate, <laughs> but I will tell you that that this woman will forever now look at a mango twice before she eats it. You know, And how would she have avoided this if she had looked carefully at the mango? She might not have even seen the larvae. Yeah, you know, they may not have been true. that visible. Yeah. So in your book, there are two pages... Yeah. More, yes, three well, on myiasis is uh, causing flies. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you remember that? Oh, we have a whole yes. Oh, we have a whole. Section. Did we remember? Did we remember that? <laughs> Who wrote that? <laughs> well, Robert Quads actually wrote that he part of it. He did. He did a great job, and he did a section. fantastic job. We should we should yeah. say that too. And so that's why it's a multiple authored. You know, book. you know what the approach might be. So when I was down there, the the head of the the Fimeric group down there, her um, fiance Camilla from originally from Venezuela. He has started this economic venture with it's like cooperative between Dominican Republic people and, and Haitians, and uh, they are growing um, in a sustainable, uh, non pesticide manner mangoes. <laughs> right. And then what they're doing is they're drying them and then they're exporting them to, you know, Germany, mm -hmm. the U.S. And I think that if you dry the mangoes, you're you, you're not gonna you're not gonna get this. Oh, you won't. So maybe in the future, instead of eating all these fresh mangoes, <laughs> Just people it. should should buy this man's product. That's right. Yeah, but it's nothing like a fresh mango, man. <laughs> there is nothing. <laughs> it's great. You're absolutely right. They are really good. It's great. You're wonderful. All right, let's move on, you gentlemen. Fine, gentlemen. Take are we up line. to our article? Uh, we are up to our article, but first, I want to tell everyone about the sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream. It's the world's first 
ad-free nonfiction streaming service. They have over 1,500 titles and 600 hours of content. I must say, this is the last time you'll be hearing about Curiosity Stream on TWIP. Our contract is up at the end of the year. Alas. I hope they've gotten what they hoped for from our listeners. Anyway, back to the show. It was founded by John Hendricks, who, who was with originally Discovery Channel, and that means you're going to be seeing real science shows. This is not science fiction. You're listening to TWIP because it's real science. It's not fake science, like fake news. It's real <laughs> right. science. <laughs> right. And that's what you're going to get on Curiosity Stream. You can watch it on your computer in your web browser. Just go to curiositystream.com, or you can u- watch it on your TV if you have a Roku or a Chromecast or an Apple TV or any other number of devices, you can watch it on your TV. It's available in every country in the world. Dixon tells me there are 196 countries in the world, although that may change. It may change. This is true. And you can get it in all of them. What they have is a wide variety of science and technology content, mm-hmm. like nature history, much more interviews, lectures. They have Stephen Hawking's favorite places, a brand new series where he pilots a fantastical spaceship, a computer-generated spaceship, and he stops at his favorite destinations. Digits, a three-parter hosted by Derek Mueller, who created the YouTube science channel that many of you may know of, Veritasium. It explores online safety and security. Maybe the Russians should look at that one. Maybe they have already. <laughs> they have. Features interviews with former NSA contractor Edward Snowden. You know, there's some pressure for him to be pardoned before the end of this administration. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh-huh. I don't think so. And Vint Cerf, co-founder of the internet, along with uh, Al Gore. Who? Al Gore. <laughs> Just kidding. Not true. <laughs> Deep Time History, a three-part series on the universe's 14 billion year history and Dixon's 13 billion year history. The oldest man on earth. It's <laughs> You're 13 billion years old. That's amazing, isn't such it? Such experience. But you, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, we sir. are all 13 billion years old. You know why? Because why? that's when the elements were created. And, and they're never just the created or destroyed. They right? don't age. So we're all created <laughs> out of the ancient building blocks of the, the universe. Wow, I feel kind of old now. Isn't that hard to believe? Yeah, it is. We're really, all made of stardust, I mean that, right? Who's, we are all made of was that interesting uh, way to put it. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. That's right. <laughs> that well, was a scientist. <laughs> how many living organisms do you think all of your molecules have passed through before they ended up in you? Billions and billions. Exactly. It's a fascinating way to look at it. Exactly. Dixon. Exactly. You have true insight. Well, hmm. Only what I would expect from a 14 billion year old man. Exactly right. <laughs> you can also. Check out their super high-definition content, 4K. They have over 50 hours of that. They have monthly and annual plans available, starting at just $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee. I went for it. It's nothing. For (laughs) for learning, it's nothing. I think you should spend as much as you can on learning or find free stuff like TWIP. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. If you start now, you're going to get January, February, and March of 2017. Right. Two entire months free. No, not two. Two months. January and February of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe right. at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for all their support of TWIP over the past six months. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. We, we're, we're we appreciate grateful. it. Very grateful. By the way, I should also mention, if I'm the oldest person in the world because I'm 14 billion years, that makes Mel, Mel Brooks the second oldest man in the world because he's 2,000 years old. <laughs> Dixon, do you think if you were theoretically 14 billion years old, do you think you'd also be the wisest man in the world? I don't think aging has anything to do with uh, wise. <laughs> but you would have seen a lot. I, you would have seen everything. <laughs> you would have seen all there is. That's the best. That's Absolutely. Dixon has picked a paper for us today. Yes, but it's 
It's challenging. It's a challenging paper, and we, we applaud Dixon for picking a challenging <laughs> paper. You have the paper. courage and ignorance to pick a paper that he didn't Because, you know, understand. he could have picked the easy way out <laughs> and picked a stream study, but, you know, you know he picked I, one that's I tough. depend on the kindness of not strangers in this case, real friends, because I know that you two people can help us find our way out of the morass that this paper has put me in. Lost pathogens. Cytoadhesion 2, GC1QR, which is already a problem. Yes. Through plasmodium falciparum, erythrocyte membrane protein 1 in severe malaria. The first author is Ariel Megalon Tejada, and the last author is Alfredo Mayor. Don't you love that? It's like Reduvido. (laughs) And these people are from Barcelona, University of Barcelona. Right. Uh, They are from the University of Copenhagen. They're from the Institut Pasteur, University de Antioquia in Colombia, and the Malaria Group in New Delhi, at the Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, and also a company, ICREA, in Barcelona. Wow, what a diverse collection. Oh, that reminds me, I wanted to thank our emailers. Like last time I threw in what I claimed was Spanish and no one, you know, no one corrected me and said, boy, it doesn't sound like Spanish. <laughs> so thank you. All right, so let me... Um, Talk, Dixon. I want to give a pressy for why I picked this paper because it's important to understand the pathology of Plasmodium falciparum because it kills a lot of people. Mm-hmm. This is the deadliest uh, variety of malaria. Who, what, so, what transmits it? Which mosquito again? Anopheles mosquitoes. What species? Well, it depends on where you live. Can you give us... If you live in California, it's Anopheles freeborn eye. If you live in uh, the Middle East, it's Anopheles dirus. If you live in... Uh, uh, I'm Gambia, to, and Gambia, sure, Anopheles Gambia in, in Africa, and and it was also in South America for a while too. It isn't there anymore, but it was there for a while. So there are lots of different species of Anopheles, and they can all transmit malaria to humans. The point of this is that for a long time it was thought that the reason why it's such a deadly strain is that it has the ability to, to attach to endothelial cells, particularly precapillary endothelial cells. And there it blocks the passage of blood to the brain, and the brain goes into anoxia, and you go into a coma, and then you die. That was the old school thought of how plasmodium falciparum kills. But then it was discovered that if you measure the flow of blood through the brain, it's the same. There's no difference between cytoadhesed uh, infected red cells in the precapillary sphincters, uh, which by the way, is the junction between the precapillary of the venule, or the, the arterial rather, and the, and the capillary, and a normal brain. So there has to be some other mechanism at work here, mechanisms at work. May I ask a question? You may. Now, what you're talking about is erythrocytes. No. Uh, well, yes, I'm talking about erythrocytes that are infected. With plasmodium That's parasites. Correct. That's correct. And their surfaces now have plasmodium Antigens in them. They do. Which and are in facilitating fact, the, their adhesion yeah, that's right. to host tissues. And one of the dominant... And in that case, Dixon, I'm not done with my question. No, okay. <laughs> all right. Why is the blood flow not impeded if you have that's all these erythrocytes? It be, it's stuck. not impeded because it doesn't adhese to the capillary. Is that a new word? Is that, is that a word? Adhese? Adhese. Isn't it adhere? I think adhere is the word, yes. Adhere, adhere. adhere. <laughs> you say potato and I say, wait a minute, and we're back to that one I now. mispronounce <laughs> words, but at least I'm actually using words. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, all right. All right. Um, adhesion is a word. The, mm, the, it is. <laughs> yes. The mechanism for this parasite um, adhering to the precapillary endothelial cells involves a histidine-rich protein that the parasite makes and then exports into the cytoplasm of the red cell, which is largely hemoglobin, mm-hmm. and then it comes to lie up underneath the the plasma membrane of the red cell, okay, the erythrocytic membrane. And there's a charge effect on this molecule that transcends the membrane and that allows it to adhere to the endothelial cells. And that's the mechanism that everybody thought was responsible for this. It turns out that there are lots of other molecules that this parasite, once inside of a red cell, can attack and attach to, and a lot of them are on other red cells. So that's the reason why this paper caught my attention, and that's the reason why I thought it would be interesting to open up this discussion. So my understanding, Dixon, which is very small, I must say, because I'm not a parasitologist, as you know, is that this protein called the Plasmodium falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein 1, PFEMP. That's the main protein that 
is attaching to host components. Correct. Is that correct? That is correct. And some of these components include host molecules like ICAM-1. Right. Which I like because it's a receptor for rhinoviruses. There you go. Uh, CD36, uh-huh. CSA, heparin, EPCR. I right. don't know what EPCR is. And GC1QR, which is in the title of this paper. <laughs> so there's a host protein to which the plasmodium erythrocyte right. protein is That's binding. Right. That's right. Now, this the gene encoding this erythrocyte membrane protein there, there are many genes in that's malaria, right? right? It's, it's a, a highly very, variable you, protein, right? Exactly right. And you'll see as the paper evolves actually why that's the case. And they have there's something like 60 different genes encoding this erythrocyte membrane protein. Correct. There's some evidence that antibodies against certain ones can inhibit a broad range of that is plasmodium, right? That's correct. So that's of interest as well. So there are parasites that are not related to this one that also contain variant what you would call proteins, or in this case, one of those called a variant antigen, the trypanosomes, right? The African trypanosomes. Mm-hmm. But also Giardia seems to have some of these proteins also. The strategy appears to cross a, uh, a variety of, of uh, I'm going to say orders, but I think I'm correct, orders of protozoa, Mastigophora, uh, Ciliophora, um, in this case, uh, Epicomplexa. So they have no genetic relationship to each other, and yet they have co-evolved these strategies for changing their coats or their attachment mechanisms to avoid immune attack. So that's the Mm -hmm. larger picture of how parasites succeed. Now, the other thing that's very important here is there's some evidence that certain types of this erythrocyte protein are uh, produced in kids with very severe malaria. Well, that's another layer of... confounding uh, data that that you have to take into account to account for the fact that in a outbreak some kids are more affected than others and mm-hmm. so why is that the case yeah and, and there's maybe been previous this... evidence that it might be associated with a certain gene exactly encoding this this protein that's exactly. in fact what they want to look at here exactly. right so they use blood from malaria patients in mozambique european travelers right and, uh, and in look, spain <laughs> in Sp- mozambique no, no, they used Spanish um, travelers, are tra- travelers returning to Spain. That's why the Spain exactly here. exactly, and they divide them up into severe or uncomplicated malaria. Right, right, and then they simply look for the transcripts. They do transcriptome analysis. Say which of these uh, erythrocyte membrane protein genes are being expressed right. in these different right. groups of malaria patients. Yeah. And the the bottom line is um, there is. First of all, adhesion to this GC1QR uh, correlates with one specific variant of this, which is called DC8, which you may think is an airplane, but it's not. (laughs) Is there a DC8? I don't know. There's a DC3. There's a DC4. Remember the famous DC10s, right? That must have been a DC8. They must have had an 8. That's that's true. And there's also a correlation with severity in certain kids with... Severe malaria, DC8, right. is present, and uh, others are present in kids with uh, not severe Indeed. malaria. So there is there is this correlation, and they have over 100 uh, patients, I think. How yeah, many there's no problem in 132, 111, 21. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, 132 total. 111 from Mozambique, 21 from European travelers. 43 had uncomplicated malaria, 43 had severe malaria. So there's a good correlation with this particular variant of the surface. I think it's be. important, maybe sort of as counterpoint to what you were talking about, is that yeah. you know we thought of it as very simple, like, oh, it basically blocks exactly. the blood vessel. Exactly. And then, but there clearly is a correlation between the degree of erythrocyte sequestration and the clinical severity. You bet. So, it, and it does seem, as we're sort of, as we're going forward, that the, the binding of the PFEMP1 variants to these different ligands, different receptors, different host molecules, um, seems to be tied in with that degree of sequestration. Yeah, yeah. And hence severity. Right. Yep. The other thing that comes out is the fact that I don't think this could happen on a first infection. So what we're looking at perhaps is a series of experiences with the same parasite over years, and that as that happens you refine the attachment mechanism and it's defined by which antibodies are present, right? And this organism has no problems producing alternate varieties of attachment molecules to avoid this 
um, mm-hmm. inability to attach to red cells. Now, now you may want to also ask, why does this parasite require attachment to erythrocytic um, cells and then to the endothelium? Why is that part of the life cycle of this organism? Or is it? Yeah, what's the what's and, the evolutionary advantage? Of okay, so doing I can this? tell you from experience, firsthand experience, I observed a highly respected um, malariologist working at Rockefeller, uh, William Traeger. He worked for years in the laboratory trying to replicate in vitro the conditions under which Plasmodium falciparum attaches to and is sequestered in the red cells, mm-hmm. but never realized, of course, that what's really going on is the fact that. When the red cell attaches to the membrane and the blood flow slows down, it doesn't stop it, it slows down, the amount of oxygen in the local area goes down, and the parasite now becomes a facultative anaerobe. And that's absolutely essential for this parasite to replicate. So here's the experiment, Dixon. You take a strain that can infect mice, right. and you delete these adhesion genes what happened <laughs> you could actually d- delete it from either the parasite or the host it's not the, the the mouse is not going to suffer much from this infection because the, yeah, it's milder it's much milder and lower parasite levels yes in the blood. absolutely right why mm. because their oxygen tension remains about the same and and for that reason the parasite won't uh, replicate as well and none okay. of the other species of malaria have this as part of their life cycle. So that, you know, you can't lump them all together and say, well, I'm studying malaria because I'm looking at uh, Plasmodium vivax, for instance, or Plasmodium malariae. If you're not looking at Plasmodium falciparum specifically, you're going to miss a big point here. The other outcome of this study is that these isolates that have high levels of this DC8, yeah. which is a f- specific form of the erythrocyte membrane protein, induce more broadly binding antibodies. Uh. So it seems to have some cross-neutralization, okay. if you will, which they do by, by binding assays. And so that right. is good because maybe that's suggesting a way you could protect against this kind of uh, infection. Right. right. They also want to know what DC8 is binding to. They would love to know that. So they, they, um, they select uh, for binding to GC1QR in vitro. They select and they enrich and they select over and over again. They get a clone of... PF with high binding to C1Q. What is C1? I looked yeah. it up. I actually <laughs> did look this one up. <laughs> C1QR. I still don't what remember. I, I can. I can. <laughs> go, I can jump in. On that. What is it? Please, yeah, I was please. actually. Yeah, I was no. actually thinking that as you guys it's a host, were forward. It's a host that. protein. So it's involved in the complement um, Compl- system, yeah. and the complement system is challenging for students to learn because it was numbered. In, in basically the order in which it was discovered. Yeah, right. So it doesn't make intuitive sense. They Someone needs to just go back and say, let's just rename everything. We'll call it the modern system. <laughs> but um, so so C1Q is one of the, um, you know, compl- compl- complement oh, yeah, one. C1Q. And, um, right. and so you see C1Q forms this complex of about 18 peptides. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because it looks almost like two, um, two Y-shaped immunoglobulin molecules oh. Held together at their base, and at the end, I'm I'm doing this with my hands because our listeners can't see what my hands are. But He's think of rabbit these, ears with this. First so, yeah, but I've got <laughs> two. I've got rabbit ears in my left hand, rabbit ears in my right hand, and then my hands are like held together at the bases. Right. And at the end of each one of the rabbit ears is a globular head. Uh-huh. So that's G. The little G is the globular head. The G stands for um, globular. Yes, the G stands for globular heads of C1Q complex. And so it's the receptor, big R, is the mm-hmm. receptor that binds the globular head of this thing. And the, the tough thing about um, C1Q, this peptide complex, is it binds to a lot of things. So it can form a bridge. So if you bind to it, you can then bind to immunoglobulins, to a lot of these immune cells. Right. Um, so it's actually a pretty useful target if, let's say, it turns out that the DC8PFEMP1 variant can bind to the to the C1Q, then you could have a bridge. Got it. So it turns out that these variants that were selected for binding to C1QR are enriched for DC8. Yep. Looks and like- in this case, right, because this thing is going to be binding, all these cells have receptors for it, you could actually go, boom, right in there. And if you bind to the receptor, you know, that receptor is there for another reason, but now it's being, um, what do you call that, when someone, you use something that some 
usurped or usurped or what is what is that? <laughs> they well, begged, borrowed, and stole. You could, you could hijacked. Usurp. I think hijacked. Hijacked. hijacked is a good term. The so problem is it implies a conscious effort, and we know that's not happening. So you karyotics, you karyotic parasites do not have consciousness. No, they, they don't, don't have a brain. I did not realize no. this. No. So I just wanted to pause here and say <laughs> that. It is such a wonderful thing to be part of this group because I don't have a clue as to what any of these terms meant before I started to read this now, paper. Now do you have and it. And now you've, you've cut through all of the, um, the molecular jargon yeah, and you've that's... simplified it to the point where we can all understand it. And so I want to thank both of you for showing me the yeah. light at the end You're of the welcome. tunnel. You're welcome. Well, no, I think, I think it can be put together sort of simply. You know, you've got infected erythrocytes that have an evolutionary advantage to to binding so they can right. get this this advantage right. and what are they binding to and and it's been known that there's a list of things that they bind to cd36 icamp1 right um csa heparin and now this receptor this complement receptor and you know the question that they're asking is is what what protein is um the plasmodium inserting into the membrane that binds to this particular receptor. And they don't even mention the hepro, the uh, histidine-rich protein no. that yeah. was originally described as yeah, one of the molecules. Of. I mean, the key here is that the kids with high, with serious malaria are producing this DC8 form of the right. erythrocyte binding protein, which seems or to I bind. Or I guess got infected by a variant, a variant. of plasmodium that has that Almost virulence. Almost sounds like the parasite is and, directing all this. <laughs> and it binds preferentially to this C1Q receptor. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's part of the mechanism of serious disease. You're inhibiting a complement pathway. I mean, because you're or, doing both. One is you're taking its place. You're... Mm -hmm. you're usurping, hijacking, anthropomorphizing, all that. So that's, um, Yeah, so it can't bind, but also it is binding. So would DC8 binding to C1QR either, would be an agonist or an antagonist? Actually, it would antagonize complement because complement can't okay. bind to the surface there. Right? So that would make possibly be a mechanism for more serious disease, right? right? If yeah. it, is is complement important for uh, blocking malaria? Do we know? I don't think so. You don't think so? No. But what do we know? Maybe. So wouldn't something. you call this a competitive inhibition then of a normal reaction Maybe. by a parasite? That's what you suggest. At least yeah. for the receptor binding, yeah. It's yeah. another, you know, it's... Yeah. yeah. Another way to look at it. And then the other point is that um, antibodies in these kids are more broadly reacting with uh, different isolates. And so that may be... And a route for therapeutics. That's what they're suggesting at yeah. the end as well. I mean, it's interesting because they're presenting, and you know, instead of let's kill things, that's usually our approach, right? Let's kill the bacteria, let's kill <laughs> right, the right. protozoan right. in this case. They're saying, why don't we block a virulence factor? Correct. Right? I mean, that's how we approach tetanus, right? We just say, that's let's true. block the toxin. Oh, right. And so here they're saying and um, too. The, the virulence is only a small percentage, right? I mean, how many million, 100 million people get malaria, but we're only about 500,000 people die, so it's yeah. less than a percent. Yeah. And maybe that percent, ha this particular virulent PFEMP1 variant of plasmodium. So if you block this cytoadherence, right. then the severity um, goes away. The kids survive malaria. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's an interesting approach. You don't, you don't need to cure malaria. You just need to prevent people from having morbidity and mortality. That's right. The other thing it does, of course, is that even if you had to treat these kids, they're awake, so you can give them an oral drug, whereas if they're in a coma, you've got to give them an intravenous drug, and those are quite different modalities that you're going to treat with. So they end Do you up agree with the, that? I, you know, I, I, pa I pause, right? Yeah, because, I saw you um, looking up. <laughs> because we, you know, the general rule is to always treat severe malaria with um, parenteral therapy. Mm. Um, now, we, we can't always do that, right? In resource-limited parts well, of the right. world, you end up giving oral because you don't have parenteral. But even if they had clear consciousness, they still had high parasitemia, severe anemia. Met, yeah, there's like a list of 10 um, that classified as severe malaria, just because you could somehow keep their cognition intact, you still would want to treat severe okay. malaria, I would think, okay. with parenteral therapy. Okay. They end up by closing by saying, we have to figure out what interaction of this erythrocyte protein with the complement receptor, C1QR, does. Yeah. And lots of possibilities, but how does that play into more severe malaria? Exactly. So that's really the interesting part, I think. Yep that that could yep. have, a, have a function there. Yep, so in, that, in the bottom line is that we still don't understand how plasmodium no. falciparum causes the main pathology in, we in, do not. in susceptible hosts. We do not. Just too bad. I, because... I apologize, we do not. <laughs> well. But it's one, one more piece of the puzzle now. They've, yeah, that's right. You know, the question of what was binding to the yeah. 
globular C1Q receptor. Now it's, it looks like it's PFEMP1 and particular variants affect the, the binding. Exactly. Daniel, you had said last time this was the first of a series of cases with a theme. Yes. Is today's case have the same theme? It does. Wow. It does. Are we ready for our yeah, clinical Yeah, let's do case? a case. Oh, this is great. Okay. Well, I'm going to be careful this time not to use the word attractive because I, I was using it as, as we mentioned to sort of <laughs> claim that there was no bad ill, but I think, you know, some people might think that I was being, well, less than progressive. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to be, be, be progressive and, and actually thanks for the person who pointed that out. You know, I, I want to be progressive. I want to move forward. And so this is like a, our president elect. Exactly. <laughs> All right, let's let's stay away from politics. <laughs> what politics? Never. Um, this is a nurse in her early twenties. She's a recent graduate who has decided instead of per- pursuing immediately a um, financially rewarding career in nursing, <laughs> she is going to devote a year of her life to a global health internship oh, nice. in the Western Dominican Republic. Get out on the Haitian border. Now, where did you actually with <laughs> with? This organization that we described before, okay. FIMRC. Okay. Um, you know, people always ask us, "Oh, I want to do international stuff." Go, go ahead and contact these people. Um, they provide these opportunities, as this woman is experiencing. And after getting to know me, I, she's down there with me while I'm working. Um, she asked me if it would be all right if I inspected a problem that she is having that seems to be getting worse rather than better. Now, she reports that on her foot, she has developed a skin issue. She was told um, that it was a fungal infection, and she's been, she's been putting antifungal cream on it, um, but it seems to be getting worse despite that. And she reports for, um, now this has been going on for several days, yeah. it's only on one foot. Was it always only on one foot? It was always only on, on foot. one foot. And only, <laughs> only on the same one foot? <laughs> the same, yeah, the same one foot. <laughs> yes, it has just, just, started just and you to define stayed this on the one on the one. Where on the foot, foot. is this? Um, well, let, let me, so at this point, it's still history. I haven't, I haven't had Got to take it. off her shoes yet. <laughs> right? okay. I'm going, I'm going, of course, you know, they say like, oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so, so at this point, it's just, we have the, the history of present illness and I, I'm going to give you a little more history. Oh, she's wearing shoes. So she's, she's wearing shoes at the <laughs> moment, which she should do more of maybe we'll see. Um, but other, as mentioned, she's a healthy, um, healthy woman, no past medical, no past surgical, no allergies. We don't have any significant concerns genetically running in the family, things like that. Um, not taking any medicines. No meds, no HIV. Um, she's HIV negative. Um, she's working as this foreign aid um, intern, and she lives with one of the local families. Actually, I think I mentioned that was one of the nice things about this organization. Everyone lived with the local families, really was part of the community. Uh, the local family, there's a daughter, there's a wife and husband, and there's a cat. Um, and I, I think we mentioned the whole cat thing, right? Where they tie the cats up inside. And, cat so the cat like has accidents in the house. You're like, you know, let him out or something. I don't know. They want to keep him inside. Um, she doesn't have any tax, toxic habits. Um, she, as far as our travel geographic history, she is um, originally from the U.S., but for... Um, Almost a year now, she's been down there in this remote rural area of the Dominican Republic, Haitian border area. And much like the woman who we met before, she does all these things. She swims in the local stream. She takes her shoes off to go to and from. Um, actually, as we mentioned, she often has shoes off in the house, walking around the house. Um, she eats a lot of local food, lots of exposure to dogs, cats, pigs, chickens. She doesn't have a twin sister that has a fondness <laughs> for mangoes. <laughs> She is not related to our mango eater. Has she walked on mangoes? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, any questions before we take a look at this? Uh, uh, does go ahead. sorry? Go ahead. Does the lesion? Uh, he hasn't taken her shoes off. Her. No, I know no, that. No, but no, she could it, say, it, it, "Does it offer any discomfort?" Yes, it is very itchy. Very itchy. Very. Is it itchy. Per, itchy. is it bleeding? Is it open? I, I had is a it, feeling you'd you say know. that actually. No, so it's not open. It's not bleeding, but it is itchy. Got it. That's all I wanted to know. Is it swollen? Um, the the rash area is raised. 
So Ray, she notices the rash is raised. By the way, um, let's but talk. Wait, and I did, and actually, you're right. I did ask her a lot of these questions. You know, you think like I say, "Hey, let's take off your shield and we take a look." But I, I try to do it the right way. So I right, right. describe this: is it right. is it like a flaky area? Right. Is there a raised area? Is it like a patch? Is it more of a, a linear thing? Um, linear. Is good, it, good, good is question. Is it blistery? And, and and what does she what does she say? She says, "Well, you know, it looks kind of serpiginous." <laughs> serpiginous, yes. I'll bet she did say something. Like she didn't use the, the word serpiginous. I use that word serpiginous, <laughs> is it serpiginous. But I would have asked, "Is it serpiginous?" And she would have said, "Well, the initial, yeah, the, the initial she describes. She says, well, it's a little blistery in certain areas, and um, it seems to be. Um, it was one place, now it's another place. So it seems ah. to be um, involving Moved. different areas on different it's days. Moving, you're saying." Well, I was just saying it involves different areas. So <laughs> oh, that sounds like it's moving to me. <laughs> so, well, we'll see about involves that. different areas, <laughs> <laughs> different days. By the way, Daniel, erythematous is that it the is right word? It is erythematous. Yes, erythematous. Well, I, you know, who knows? It's living language. <laughs> so, you so, there, so there are. So there, yeah, it is red. Okay, it is red in certain areas, and as mentioned, there's a raised Where aspect. Where is it? Is it on the so, instep so this, or the at sole? this point? I let's take now a look let's at this look. thing. So I take a look at Just this thing, off. and I um. And I, I use my iPhone. And what I like about the iPhone, actually, right? So, you know, because I put myself back into in this mood. I take a nice high contrast picture of the top of her foot. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to see a, a raised area. It looks like someone was having trouble drawing a line straight. Um, and it is a, a raised red area. It actually, yes, if people have our parasitic diseases book, I did show her that and she said oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> well, so, by the way there's a lot of pictures how did, in our book how did the how did could the, have shown her yeah, any one how did of the many. picture you just took get into your book so quickly <laughs> exactly right and that doesn't look like um, my foot <laughs> <laughs> yeah except she has nail polish on her nails so yeah, right. we could we could tell the difference um mm -hmm. but yes Oh, they'll have to page through every page. And what do I describe when I see it? So she a raised, red, irregular, um, I throw an S word in there, um, <laughs> line. It's a snake-like. Snake-like snake line, curling from the base up towards the distal aspect, and then uh, coming out, coming more proximally. Um, and as mentioned, different locations on her foot when she inspects it each day. Um and there's a somewhat similar area on the adjacent toe, but less red, um, and now actually flattening from where it had been before. And there are a couple areas with these small, fluid-filled, raised lesions. I have a mm -hmm. speculation. And it is not think. getting better with the fungal cream. She's, she's yeah, doing it. not getting better. You know, right. We say religiously, which means so what? So what's the like, active ingredient <laughs> in this antifungal? Do you know? Um, it's one of the azole creams. Oh, okay. Not griseofulvin. No. Didn't we have a similar case before? Yeah, we did. We we may have. I think we did. We may have. It's, it's, it sounds similar. Yeah, we may have had a, I mean, I'll, I'll throw it, you know, just if you say we've had a similar one before, that might be okay. Don't, well, we've done a lot of cases here, so we've, you know. When covered, did Daniel join? Uh, that's right. In good. 80, and so we're up to, this is our 43rd, um, 44th yeah. case, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Number 80, huh? We have a history. By the way, did you like the photo from the last episode? You probably didn't look oh, at the, it. Oh, uh, the or, orthogonal. No. From Twip. Oh, it was the one from the museum? Is this the one we're talking about? I like that one. Anisakis in the stomach of a striped dolphin. Oh, yes. Okay. You know, Dixon. You should go to our Just web out of courtesy, page. you might want to look at some of the work I put into this It looks website. like a painting by Francis Bacon. <laughs> so one of the letters was from a listener who had visited the museum in in tokyo and this is what he sent isn't that cool i'm going there i'm going there on thursday that's it's a dolphin gross. stomach that's and his pretty pretty so if you ate dolphin stomach dixon you wouldn't get infected they come out in your stool <laughs> yeah maybe and you'd, freak right out. <laughs> you'd freak out and go right to daniel and say what is this <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all right do you need to know anything else i've got my diagnosis. you've got it i do and she's HIV negative. I don't care about sex because it's her foot. It doesn't matter. You're nodding at me as you say that. Okay. My foot. I mean, <laughs> if it were a systemic thing, I'd worry about sex. But 
This is not doesn't sound like a sexually transmitted disease. It's local to the foot. There's no other involvement to the body. She has and no fever. Only one either, foot. Right? Yeah, only one foot. And you know what I think? You know, I I actually think that you know since I have a high um, estimate of our emailers, I think our emailers are going to just nail this right on. They're going to say, I know what that is, and they're going to say, this is what this is how you should treat it, and then you tell me if she gets better. So that's exactly. what I. So I that's what I expect from All right. her. Audiences, we, we have Good a high, back. high level of. I think you, you have. I think at this point, the ability to make the clinical diagnosis. You have the ability to look in our yeah. book. What would be the recommended treatment? Right. And then um, you can ask me whether or not she got better. How many pictures of feet are there in this book? Actually, that's interesting. There are you, many. You, there are lots of pictures. Of, picture and, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> there's more a, than one. Sure. There's there's one for. Uh, well, let's not mention. I'll mention let's not. And then there's one for. And one for one. <laughs> and, and then there's one another for. for yeah. um, yes. One stuck in my mind as soon as he said foot, which wasn't right. But exactly. Remember right. that story? I sure do. That's sure funny. Do. Indeed. That's the presidential story. <laughs> okay, so that's good. It's a little. It's a little brief because we have something else to add to TWIP, right, Dixon? We do. We do. We do. We do. So today we're inaugurating. No, no. That's not till January. Yeah, let's use a different word. No politics. <laughs> oh, oh, I see what you're saying. All right. I'll, I'll take it back then. No, but we're, we're introducing a new feature to TWIP. So are we going to take something away? No, I hope not. I, this won't take long. Um, but what we want to do is showcase the great discoveries in tropical parasitic diseases. And so we were going to call this Parasitology Superstars. I'm not sure that this first choice fits that description, to be honest. But our first, our first awardee, let's say, for this this recognition mm-hmm. is none other than Sir Ronald Ross. Yeah, I want to just say for the record that when Dixon suggested this, mm-hmm. I suggested we do him first. And Dixon declined respectfully, thinking that if you made a list of parasitologists and you put my name in the mix, I would show up dead last. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I think I would. Just a question of how long the list is. Dixon. You got it, you know. <laughs> well, that's that's all true. So what I've got in front of me is a is a two volume book. I have the volume one of that called Tropical Medicine and Parasitology: Classic Investigations, Volume One, edited by B. H. Keen, M. D. Kenneth Mott, M.D., and Adair J. Russell. These august authors have painfully, at times, found all of the original literature uh, with regards to, and then you have to fill in that blank. And in this case, we're going to talk about, since our paper was about malaria, we should talk about the person who was given credit for discovering that malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes. And it's none other than Sir Ronald Ross. So here's the description that occurs in the book to describe who Ronald Ross is. And that's what I'm going to do from now. And I will read their description. It won't take me long, but you'll see right away that it's not exactly flattering and it's not exactly non-flattering. It's sort of, it's neutral. And it's up to the audience to judge whether or not these comments that are made that will follow uh, actually um, adequately describe this person. So here's... Here's the, uh, so to speak, the obit on Ronald Ross. And it's a paper called The Role of the Mosquito in the Evolution of Malaria Parasite. It's published in The Lancet, Volume 2, pages 488 to 489, a very short paper in 1898. And the author is Ronald Ross, and his dates are 1857 to 1932. Although Ross ultimately became one of the most eminent scientists of his age and received the Nobel Prize in medicine, he passed his medical examinations, in quotes, without distinction, after training at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. He was born in India, the son of a distinguished army officer. Ross, the eldest of ten children, was sent to England at the age of eight for his education. After receiving his M.D., however, he returned to his native land, that's India, as a surgeon in the Indian Medical Service. While working in the vast subcontinent, Ross became interested in the study of malaria, but because of faulty technique, again, remember he didn't graduate at the head of his class, was never able to see in the blood the parasites. Now, Laverand had described these parasites in blood 
in 1880. So someone else had made that original observation, and by the way, he shared the Nobel Prize with Ross. During a leave in London in 1894, however, Sir Patrick Manson, considered the founder of modern tropical medicine and parasitology, showed him the parasites in the blood of a patient in Charing Cross Hospital. On his return to India, Ross renewed his work on malaria and in 1895 found the flagellated forms of the parasite in the stomach of an Anopheles mosquito, which had fed on a malarial patient. Two years later, he saw the pigmented parasites also in a mosquito's stomach, and one year thereafter demonstrated sporozoites in the salivary glands of these insects. By the way, all of that work was done in birds. These three discoveries established transmission of malaria by the mosquito. Upon his retirement from the Indian Medical Service in 1899, Ross was appointed lecturer on tropical diseases at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. In 1923, he was made the director of the Royal Institute and Hospital for Tropical Diseases, and in 1926, he became the director of the new Ross Institute, named in his honor. Busy as he was in his chosen field, Ross nevertheless found time to be an accomplished musician and writer and a highly reputable mathematician. In fact, some of his mathematical formulae were used to model outbreaks of malaria, and those formulae are still in use today. The conclusion that malaria was transmitted by the mosquito was a painful process. Ross's ideas evolved gradually, and each publication from 1897 through 1899 added more information. This paper includes a plate illustrating the development of an avian malarial parasite in the stomach of the mosquito, an epoch-making observation which showed conclusively that the ex-flagellation was a stage in the reproductive cycle. Ross confirmed this work on blood from a patient with Plasmodium falciparum. Giovanni Battista Grassi, his dates were 1854 to 1925, in 1898 also described the mosquito as the vector of malaria, but in his case, he described correctly the Anopheles mosquito as being the vector for human malaria. So that's, that's basically the vignette that I want to leave our listeners and you can look up Sir Ronald Ross's uh, bibliography and his biography, and there are many accountings of him, and some of them are accurate and some of them are very inaccurate. As you will see when you start to peruse that literature, that common literature which is online in the Internet invented by Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, Sir Ronald Ross is recognized as a true hero for establishing the fact that mosquitoes can serve as vectors of disease. but it was Theobald Smith earlier that showed that the tick was indeed a vector for cattle and, and for a, uh, a Babesia infection in cattle known as Texas fever. Uh, and in fact, it was because of Theobald Smith's original discovery that everybody else started to look for insects as transmitters or, or arthropods, I should say, because ticks are not arth- uh, insects, they're arachnids. Uh, and, and Ross followed up on that. So this is part of a rich history of early discovery for not only establishing the germ theory of disease, but also the causative agents of those diseases. He was the first Brit to get the Nobel Prize. Yes, he was. How about that? And he, he wasn't well-liked, I must say. Really? A lot of people had deep <laughs> resentment over the fact that the Nobel Committee chose him over uh, Grassi, for instance. And there's a, a bit of history to that, too, because Grassi had hosted Koch from Germany to welcome him into his lab in Italy to look for the parasite and discovered to his chagrin that Koch was uh, not such a good microscopist. Are you choking? Sorry. No, you no. Okay? It's need some water. like the like the, like the stuff in the red can, Coke. <laughs> Coke. Oh, Coke. Well, I, I, I pronounce it Koch. <laughs> <laughs> and then, regardless of what happened next, it, it was because of that incident when Coke or Koch, Coke. walked Just Coke. out of Giovanni's, uh, <laughs> Grassi's laboratory that he became the ch- the chairman of the Nobel Nominating Committee, and that's the reason why Grassi's name was dropped from the list, <laughs> because of some political run-in that they had had earlier on. And it was uh, so sad to see that true credit wasn't given to the uh, to the descriptor of Anopheles as being the transmitter of malaria to people. Did you know that Ro- Ronald Ross Primary School near Wimbledon Common is named after him? Look at that. The school's coat of arms includes a mosquito. 
I, I knew you'd enjoy that. That's these, great. These, I like that. So this is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. And so we're going to continue this. We should post a picture of Ross on the show notes today just to let you know that uh, there is a, bit, a history to it. He Ross. looks a bit like you. I'll just post you. <laughs> and I get this all the time. Hey, aren't you This Ronald is a Ross? funny thing. He's got it. sort of Ronald Ross, KCB, KCMG, FRS, FRCS. The only one I know is Fellow of the Royal Society. Yeah, well, Fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. It's FR. CS right. KCMG is the Order of St Michael and St George and KCB is Order of the Bath. Look at you. It's all on Wikipedia invented by Al Gore. <laughs> yeah, well watch out for the <laughs> Wikipedia descriptions. <laughs> we just have two emails today and that'll wrap it up. Hey, Daniel, I think you should take the first one. <laughs> Tamara writes. <laughs> yes, I, need, I do too by the way. <laughs> I need help with figuring out all of my true infestations. I have been sick for several years. I recently was diagnosed with this strongyloides or a cross over other type of worm. Um, I see them in my eyes. I'm not sure I had treatment for a different mite problem. Now the doctor that found the serology positive doesn't want to test anymore. Yet I've had pneumonia countless times. I was given steroids. My thyroid has a nodule and so does my vocal cords. I need to know where I can go that actually has experience. Thank you, Tamara. I don't know where Tamara lives. Um, but, you know, the, the Affordable Care Act allows you to see a physician, right? It, um, I, I think it makes it illegal for you not to buy health insurance. I don't know if it actually... <laughs> <laughs> that, that was my takeaway from the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> now, it could have a really high deductible, and when you go see the doctor, you have to pay everything yourself. But I think it does make it illegal and you get penalized if you don't buy a plan from one of the health insurance companies. Um, but no, this is this is this is tough, Tamara. I don't know where she lives or um, Of course. So Yeah, if you tell us where you live, we probably won't be able to help you unless it's New York or Colorado, right? <laughs> yeah, it's actually yeah. Or maybe it's Haiti, Dominican Republic. Yeah, part of this issue of, of not being able to be diagnosed with certain entities might relate to the problem that we're trying to address with our um, giveaway for our textbook because this course on parasitic diseases is no longer included into the normal medical curriculum. So these newly emerged physicians may not have enough knowledge to make the differential diagnosis to include some of these entities. What is it that uh, um, our friend in Long Island said? There's one class... One lecture on parasites. One. Yeah, in the entire medical education. Yeah, um, what, what's which the, is really, they, which is really, actually, we were, we were talking about this over lunch. We were eating a very unhealthy lunch, Dixon and I. No, I wouldn't say that. And uh, I would say it. And, uh, <laughs> and one of the tough things is they're trying to cram so much information into the same block of time that they used to, right? For, for time immemorial, right? It's been four years and you get your MD degree. And I'm not sure what they used to teach during those four years, like back before there was antibiotics, right? Um, but now, now there's been this incredible growth of knowledge, and you still cram it into those four years. And so there's the issue of what they leave out, and they are now leaving out parasitology. Um, and also the fact that they usually, during this four years, they, they take away the joy of learning, the curiosity that these um, young people, students have that are, are going to end up being physicians. And so, you know, you need to be a lifelong learner, I think, to be an excellent physician. And so, you know, you're not going to learn it all in four years, but at least during those four years, they could start to lay the foundation, they could get people excited, they can give them, or, or, you know, usually if you've gotten to medical school, you have some interest in educating yourself. So somehow they, they can take that and move it forward. So, so I don't know in the case of Tamara whether or not this is just a really challenging clinical situation or whether it's a lack of education. Um, you know, she may not have run into the right clinician to be able to help yeah, her. Exactly. Um, but no, I mean, we, you know, one of the things is um, we do have our, our textbook online. So Tamara herself can read through that, see if she gets a sense, and then hopefully work with the, the doctor to try to get a sense. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of people who, who, you know, present like this may not actually still have at this point the parasitic infection, but they may have um, 
the either psychological impact of having had or gone through this experience. And so a lot of times um, that's part of the treatment too. You don't just, I think as a clinician, throw up your hands and say, I'm not going to treat you. You may not be treating someone with an anti-helmet therapy at this point, but you may Mm -hmm. be bringing some other therapeutic approach to bear. Mm -hmm. All right. Our last email of 2016 is from Vic who writes, Dear TWIP team, in TWIP 122, you received a listener email which described a new drug delivery system being tested in pigs. This was a capsule which expanded oops, in the pig's stomach and allowed drugs contained in the casing to be slowly delivered through the digestive system. If you remember that. It I, I wasn't skeptical at working. I was just frightened about <laughs> someone putting this in my stomach. And it would not get out of the stomach. <laughs> It would slowly release the drug. You all seem slightly skeptical <laughs> that this would work. The story that follows bears out your skepticism. In the early 70s, my dad owned several livestock markets in Nebraska. As a result, we often had hundreds of feeder calves. Feeder calves are calves that have been weaned from their mothers and usually weigh between 500 and 600 pounds. Wow. <laughs> that we had to feed for a few days between sales. Feeding those calves was a very expensive proposition and my dad was always looking for ways to economize on his grain and hay expenditures. My Uncle David was a veterinarian who had left private practice and gone to work for the Eli Lilly Company in the early 60s. By the 70s, he was in charge of the agricultural division of Eli Lilly. Uncle Dave had lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. One of those ideas was that hay, which, although it has some nutritional value, was much more important as a digestive stimulant. This is because in the largest of the animal's stomachs, the rumen, hay scratches the wall of the stomach, which aids and improves some of the digestive processes. Additionally, hay helps to abrade grains, which are then more efficiently absorbed. The problem is that the hay also gets digested and is passed out of the system and then needs to be replaced. So if instead of scratchy hay, you could (laughs) use a scratchy plastic that would remain undigested in the rumen, you could potentially eliminate the need to constantly replace that expensive hay. Who knows? It might work. I like this. <laughs> Consequently, Uncle Dave and his had his lab create plastic boluses, which were about the size of a charcoal briquette, a couple of inches in diameter, I guess. You could shoot these down the throat of a calf with a bolus gun. Oh, my god! The boluses would enter the rumen where they would pop open and become about the size of a softball a softball with a very spiny, scratchy surface. Because they were plastic, they were supposed to float in the liquid of the rumen, scratching the walls and abrading the grain. And because they were the size of a softball, they would not be able to pass through the rest of the calf's complicated digestive system. No need for hay. Problem solved. Money saved. Everybody happy. Well, we ran 75 calves through the chute and gave each of them about 10 of the magic boluses. It's a clinical trial, right? I guess so. Where was, yeah, I guess there was a control group. No one was right. really sure how many we should use, but 10 seemed like a good number to start with. This was not the first time we had worked with Uncle Dave to test materials and methods, so we were used to a fairly ad hoc system of testing. More about that in another email that I will someday get around to writing to you guys at the Urban Agriculture Podcast concerning how American agriculture became what it has been become but i digress and we will continue that next year right dixon we will yes we each calf got 10 boluses we fed them their daily grain ratio Mm. and went home ration ration and went home we assumed that it would take a day or two for the magic to begin to work but confidence was high that we had entered a brave new hay free world Mm -hmm. the next morning we all gathered at my dad's republican valley livestock market in Franklin, Nebraska, to check out our 75 calves. We were pretty sure that they would be happily munching their corn and oats <laughs> and not missing hay at all. They were indeed happily munching their corn and oats while standing in hundreds of piles <laughs> of what appeared to be huge, black, spiny, plastic, softball-sized spiders. We didn't count them, but it seemed a fair bet that they were around <laughs> 750 on the ground. That would work out around 10 per calf, mm. wouldn't it? <laughs> I guess Uncle Dave, as a scientist and researcher, was used to unexpected results. He just shrugged and probably was already thinking of another problem to be solved. We, on the other hand, were pretty shocked. 
I, as a teenager who was regularly tasked with cleaning out the pens at the market, oh, was dismayed to realize that I was going to be <laughs> the one who had to deal with this spiny plastic mess. My goodness. The calves did not seem to mind at all. They were just looking forward to getting their trough filled with hay. <laughs> I certainly wish the folks that are testing the palm-sized gizmos that will slowly deliver drugs to those pigs the very best of luck. <laughs> I do, however, feel sorry for the kid who is going to be scooping out the pig barn. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I like this. Med Venlig Hilsen. <laughs> Dixon, you know what that means, right? I don't, actually. Oh, yes, you did. Men, Med Venlig Hilsen means with friendly greetings. Okay. You know what language it is? It's got to be Norwegian because he yeah. says he's from Norway. Yeah, it's Norway. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Vic Philipson, P.S. I am the ship's agent from Christiansand, Norway, who has written to you a couple of times on TWIV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry to sandbag you right. a bit, but I have lived in Europe for 25 years, 16 <laughs> of them here in Norway. Wow. You know what sandbagging is? Yeah. It's kind of when you don't reveal.